Happy Monday and welcome to Reading the Bible is Easy-ish, a weekly video and podcast where each week we stumble and bumble and try to engage the Bible. Uh, I am Hogan Brock, a pastor at 7th Street Christian Church in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Each week we feature a guest offering their perspective and their way of reading the Bible. If you have suggestions for future guests, something nice to say, or snarky comments, you can send those to readingthebibleiseasy-ish at gmail.com. And of course, please subscribe, rate, and review, and share the show with uh, anyone you think would like it. My guest this week is the only person that I have remained friends with after meeting them for the first time in a suit. It is Dami Oluwalana. Dami, how are you? I'm doing well, Hogan. How are you? <laughs> I'm great, man. Uh, for people who don't know, and that's probably everyone who's watching this, Dami and I were friends in college. Uh, I was his RA for his first year, and then we were co-RAs together for uh, a year. Dami is living in Memphis, but I'll invite him to tell him uh, tell a little bit about himself. Well, hello, everybody. I am Dami. I no longer fit in the suit that I'm not wearing, but that's okay. You know, we all grow I don't up. fit any, in any of my clothes from that year either. So <laughs> it's amazing how, you know, how much we, how much we grow. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Tennessee in Memphis. I'm working on a degree, a PhD in cancer and developmental biology. I have really been interested in medicine for pretty much all my life and, you know, doing lots of learning right now, it is very hard and it is very, um, it is very cool, you know, learning a lot about myself and a lot about the things that I'm going to be focusing the rest of my life on. Um, I'm from Nigeria. I grew up in the Gambia and now I live here. I have a little brother. Um, this is a lot of information. Wow. Um, and I, uh, I've always been a Christian. This is kind of a thing to the actual topic at hand. Uh, but like Bible study has never really been a strength. Um, grew up in the word, grew up, you know, teaching it here and there, but I've never been able to keep up regularly with reading the Bible. So um, Hogan leading this project is something that's really, really dear to my heart because it's one of those things that I've, I've struggled with for the past couple of decades and always looking to improve. You know, there's always room for growth, right? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, that's that's the story of so many people. It's my story, too. Right. Like consistent engagement with the Bible is 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 hard. It's a it's a hard habit to form. So, Damien, when you do read the Bible, what what tools do you use? What lenses do you bring? Just kind of how do you how do you think about reading the Bible? So I first of all, tools. I love, love, love the Bible project. They are out of Portland, they've got a website, and I think there is a there is a pseudo app for it. I say pseudo because it's not from them. I think somebody developed an app and like put all their content on it to make it accessible for people. But the Bible Project, it's really good. They've got some really good podcasts that really have a. They go through a lot of the um, historical and just the deep theology of what's going on in each text. Make connections that you, as a casual reader may not necessarily see or observe, but they with all their fun theological background and everything have learned and have seen all these things. So they've been really good to open my eyes to a lot of things. Um, In terms of lenses, I think focuses on Christianity are very different here than from where I grew up. I think we grew up really focusing on the spiritual aspects of things where, you know, the Bible talks a lot about healing and about um, spiritual warfare and all that kind of stuff. And that was a big, a big focus of our faith at home is that, you know, our God is bigger than whatever challenge the, the, the enemy can throw at us. And you come over here and there's a lot more focus on the theology and on the, um, I guess, the history and on the literature of everything. I remember being in New Testament with Chad Hartsock and he really thrown that in a Christian class, we're talking about, you know, some of the historical accounts and what the context of the scripture was and that stuff I'd never been exposed to, you know? So I think I bring both of those mindsets best I can into what I read and try to see where the Holy Spirit is at work and where the, where the scripture is trying to point to you and also see, well, what was going on in that time? And, you know, what is this New Testament passage, this Old Testament passage, what is this referencing that I may not be familiar with in my current modern context, which is very nerdy, I guess, of me, but also that's the way the crumble cookies. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So each week we will walk blindly into the text, having done next to no preparation. The texts are guided by what my church is doing in the coming week. And right now those are from the Sanctified Art Series uh, during Lent. Our text 
is from John 12, verses 20 to 33. We're going to be reading the New Revised Standard Version. Again, that's John 12, 20 through 33. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, is how I'm going to say that this time, in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. All right, Dami. What a text. I'm going to set a timer for five minutes. Sounds good. All right, and here we go. So any, any kind of initial thoughts, things that stick out to you in this text? I think the one of the first things is the whole die to yourself trip that, and I don't know if trip is the right word to use, but I, you see that a lot in Christ ministry, right? That we are very self-obsessed and rightfully or unrightly so, I mean, there's a lot to be said for being content with yourself and being, you know, comfortable with who you are, but also when that becomes our primary objective, that kind of detracts from what the what we're supposed to be as Christians, to be hands and feet of Christ and to minister the Lord to other people and like, you know, generate that love and foster that community. So I think it's yeah, that's the first thing that stands out to me. Yeah. And I, I like holding that next to um let's see, verse 25, right? So there's, there's a sense that, yeah, selflessness is what we're going for, mm -hmm. but also there's those who love their life, lose it. Right. Mm -hmm. But in those who hate their life, keep it for eternity. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm torn by that language a little bit because there is this sense to me that to love your life is almost like you could read that as, is loving your life being the appropriate thing and you lose your life for Christ for you give it to something else or, uh, maybe hating your life is giving your life up. It may be that's a, like a dualism kind of thing, right? Like hating the flesh. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's interesting. The other thing that kind of just caught me off guard at the very beginning of this text is the, um, some Greeks were there and they come to Philip and Philip uh, goes and gets someone else <laughs> goes to get Andrew and they go together. And then we never hear from the Greeks again. Like, I'm not sure what Jesus was doing here. The Greeks wanted to see Jesus. Huh. Uh, and then they just kind of disappear. And this is kind of Jesus's reaction to being asked uh, to see them. So I'm curious what's happening there. I, I really don't know. I then actually announces that they disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That feels like a John thing to me. Like I know that John can, John prompts things and there's probably some sort of subliminal reason there that, mm -hmm. that I'm not aware of. Right. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting. Anything else that sticks out to you? Not right now. Let me let me go through it again. And yeah, go for it. We'll, we'll do some more chatting. Yeah, maybe I can draw your attention to something. When you, one of the things I like to do with, so like this last part of this text, 27 to 33, yeah. where we get Jesus saying, what should I do? Uh, and then saying, I'm not going to ask Father, as it says in this text, but we'll assume that's that's God. Um, to save Jesus from this hour as he's talking about his death. Um, so there's this really, it feels like a tense moment to me, but there's this, um, this breaking in that it seems to be significant in scripture, right? When, when we hear the voice of God or the voice of an angel, whatever we want to describe that as here. Um, I like to picture that. I'm, I'm curious, 
when you hear, uh, as it says in verse 28, um, a voice came down and said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. What, what do you make of those sorts of moments, those breaking, breaking in of God? Uh, that's not something that I've necessarily experienced in the world. Um, I'm just curious what you might think about that. I think that they are moments when God is really pulling your attention to something that you may not be seeing. Like we see this mm. when he wrestles with um, Jacob. Jacob? Right. Yeah. 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 Um, we see it again, you know, when the several times he speaks to Abram and gives Abram his directions. And then coming into the New Testament, we see it with uh, Christ's baptism. We see it with Saul's conversion to Paul. We see, and these tend to be like key points. And like you've said, key points where somebody's getting specific instructions to do something or somebody's walking the wrong way, like Balaam, mm-hmm. Balak, and the donkey. And is being told, hey, focus up. This is my call to you. This is where I'm sending you. So I think when God physically intrudes into the human space, as it were, for lack of a better term, when he makes himself very, very tangible and noticeable, I think that's what he is actively doing. And I think the message here, I mean, this is something that we've all experienced, right? If you have to go, not even, I'm not even going to go spiritual here you can't leave your dishes in the sink all the time. Mm. You you need to go do them. And sometimes you need something or somebody to come in and say, Hey, that's piling up, pick it up. Let's, let's, let's get this done. And you don't want to do it. Like you hate it. You really want to say, I don't want to do this, but you know, for everything to be okay, that needs to be done. I think that's what's happening here is Christ as a fully man, fully God entity to say i really don't want to die like i would rather not (laughs) that sucks i want to you know take this cup away from me we see this in the garden of gethsemane several times where he's like i would rather not die and i think this is me just thinking through it right now i think a lot of times we just gloss over the fact that this is a man who is about to die and he knows that he's about to die Mm. he is well aware that this is the end of his physical human life but he has to trust God and that aspect of him that is God knows that, you know, this is, there's a purpose for this and that purpose needs to be fulfilled. But by gosh, I mean, can you imagine how scary that would be? Just like you can see your death ahead and you know, what's going to happen. You've got, you've got the, the whole world time is not even real for you. It's just like a blink of your eye and you know what happens in the end from the beginning, but also you're fully human and a man, you know, I, th- I think about, you know, all the times that it's like before a big test or something, and you're like, oh, this is, I'm, I'm about to fail or lose this or lose that. And, you know, those, those things are just really trivial compared to an entire life ending. And, you know, mm. the, the fate of everybody's salvation resting on your shoulders. So I think, I think those are, that's a very human aspect of God showing up and, of Christ showing up. And I think that's very, that's, that's God saying, Hey, let's, let's, let's get this done because I Mm. I want to be one with my creation again. Mm. That's really beautiful. Well, Dami, we've reached the end of our five minutes. Oh, thank you for, (laughs) thank you. No, you did beautifully. Thank you for the, the really beautiful reflection. So I'll give my major takeaways real quick, and then I'll invite you to give yours as well. What you drew me there what you drew me to there at the end is something that I've been uh, wrestling with, I feel like for a little while now, and that's the embodiment of Christ, the, the humanness of Christ. I think you're right to say that like fully God, fully man. Um, but I think when I think about Christ, like, as you were saying in the death, uh, Christ's death, I, it's trivial to me sometimes as silly as it is to say that, like, this is God, of course, like God knows what's happening. Um, but to say, no, that like, Jesus dying on the cross, like the anxiety, the fear, the pain, anything you would feel coming up to that was just as real to Jesus as it would be to us. That's a point where I, uh, in, in my soul right now, where I connect deeply with God, this sense of understanding um, that Jesus gets it. Jesus went through these intense emotions like we do in different stages of our life. So um, I think for me, that's something I would wrestle with for the 
for the next few days? Anything that you would want to kind of carry forward in, into your week or things you might want to dive a little deeper into? I think, I think that too. I think that's something that, especially, you know, I share that I am working on my PhD and there's so much that is anxious, anxiety inducing in the process, you know, is your research going to work out? Are you putting enough effort into one thing versus another um, and trying not to be like just fearful of the future and of everything imploding and not working out for you, which I feel like if someone's walking into their death, they, I mean, there's always that doubt, right? As a human being, well, is this, is this plan going to work? I know that we are God and we're capable of everything and all things that if we see the, the man Jesus as a man and as God embodied in human flesh, then we have to, I mean, I feel like at some level we have to understand that, you know, some of this is going on in his head. Some of these fears and some of these doubts, which are inherent to our human nature, are things that are going on in his head and things that he's wrestling with. So um, I think I'm interested in exploring that further and seeing how he overcame that and kind of the ways he discusses his, his trust in the Lord. And I feel like a lot of times in our reading of the scripture, he seems to just dust it off and be like, oh, it's fine. But I'm interested to see if he actually discusses some of the things that he's doing, you know, through, through the scripture. That'll be a fun, a fun journey. Sure. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. So, Dami, that's going to be it for this episode of Reading the Bible is Easiest. Thank you so much for being my guest this week. Okay. Uh, so if you'd like to reach out to the show, request a guest, uh, maybe you have someone as good as Dami or leave snarky feedback. <laughs> You can do that by emailing reading the Bible is easy ish at gmail.com. A big thanks to Dami for taking the time to uh, join us today. I look forward to seeing you back here next week. And until then, keep trying. See y'all.